Good morning, and welcome to St. Peter's Church in Essex Fells, New Jersey, for this Sunday morning worship on the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. You'll find a service leaflet on the website, which you can follow at home and join in the responses and the hymns. And now as we prepare ourselves for worship, our organist, John Pravarnik, will play the tune of Father, we thank the U.S. planted to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we gather to worship God, let us call to mind the ways in which we strayed from the way of Christ. For the ways we have injured the fabric of God's goodness in ourselves and others, Lord, have mercy. For the ways we have been part of fraying the fabric of goodness in creation itself, Christ, have mercy. For the ways we have injured God's heart of compassion and love, Lord, have mercy. May God forgive you all your sins, cleanse your hearts, and renew his grace in your souls. Amen. And now as our song of praise, we stand and sing God of grace and God of glory, which you can find in your hymnals at home at hymn 594 and in your service bulletin. Verses 1, 2, and 4. Church's glory, 
Let us pray. For the God, protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Here now a reading from the book of Genesis. Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. And Ra Leah's eyes were lovely. And Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. In the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I, I not serve you with, for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, but this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week for this one, and we will give you the other one in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, as a wife. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 119 in response from the asterisk. Your decrees are wonderful. Therefore, I obey them with all my heart. When your word goes forth, it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant. I long for your commandments. Turn to me in mercy. As you always do to those who love your name. Steady my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me. And I will keep your commandments. Let your countenance shine upon your servant. And teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears. Because people do not keep your law. The epistle is from the book of Romans, chapter 8. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God we know that in all things God works for good together with those who love God who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he all predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn it? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution 
or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now as our sequence hymn before the gospel, we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds in your bulletin, verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'll sing all verses. <laughs> The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like the, a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, and then his joy, in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw up the bad. Have you considered all this, Jesus said. They answered, yes. He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of God is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure 
what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's no way to do it alone. I mean, there's no way to survive alone. Yes, we have fantasies and movies about rugged individuals, real people who survive all alone, but if we think they're doing it all alone, it's a misconception. Yes, there are persons skilled in wilderness survival, mountain climbing, all kinds of things who can make it, but they don't do it alone. They may be solitary, but they're not alone because they're in a myriad of support systems. For starters, they have to breathe. And when they breathe, they're literally breathing in the breath of life, the breath of the planet. They have to eat and that depends on the community of flora and fauna. And what we know now, which the ancients do it, is that the flora and fauna, the plants and the flowers and the animals are not isolated individual trees or animals, but they're exquisitely intertwined, interdependent systems. That solitary man or woman out there is depending on the planet to survive. The celebrated individual is actually a community in himself or herself. Many communities, all the way from the vital community of internal bacteria in the guts that we now know is an extraordinarily important part of our physical health, the good bacteria. They're the cooperative community of our cells and organs, the internal soul community, made up of everyone who has influenced us everyone upon whom our hero has depended from infancy as he or she became more self-reliant. As the great psychologist William James said, what we call a person is actually a cluster of partial selves around a central organizer. And all of us experience that when we're of two or three minds about something, or as the old phrase goes, at sixes and sevens. We, like God, are one, and many, a community. Now we ignore this at our peril because our continued life depends on these communities and they're nested like those Russian dolls where there's the big doll and then there's a the smaller doll and, the, and you get to this tiny little doll in the middle. Or like baskets that are nested in each other. We are in the midst of nested communities. Our small self is nested in our relationships and our family, which is internalized so that we're a part of everything we've met and everything we've met is a part of us. And that's dependent on the larger social order and that's dependent on the larger international order and the economy and all of that. And all of that's nested within the environment itself. We call it selfishly in the environment because we mean it's that which is surrounding us. It's a community of communities upon which all life depends. That breath of life is the breath of every creature. And that environment is nested within the divine life itself. We're having a service of the Holy Eucharist this morning where I'll receive the bread and wine representative of the congregation and you're invited to make a spiritual communion. But the Holy Eucharist is more than communion. It's a place where we recognize this nested, interwoven community of all things. It's a place where we recognize that our lives are dependent on this largest nest of the vital life of the divine itself and at the altar, listening to the word of God, praying with the spirit moving through us, coming to the altar, lifting bread and wine to be blessed, the natural world, our lives to be blessed by God's own energy. We enter into the dance 
of all creation and the dance of the divine life itself. That is why God is pictured for us Christians as a community. On the front of your service leaflet, there's one of the famous Russian icons of the Holy Trinity, symbolized as the three angels who come and visit Abraham and Sarah and promise them a child. And that icon represents the dynamic life of the Trinity in which everything is embedded. The Father's love for the Son who is the architect of the worlds, and therefore that's the Father's love for the world, and the Holy Spirit, which is that, that force of love between them, which is the Holy Spirit moving through the world, God's love moving through the world, moving through everything natural, lifting it to openness with the divine. Now the theme of community weaves its way through the entire scriptures. Because every part of the Bible, the myth, the history, the story, the law, the wisdom, is about community first and persons second. Persons in community, depending on community, this, contributing to community out of the, distinct, the distinctive gifts that they develop. With Laban and his nephew, we learn the importance of family and tribe and the trouble caused in relationships by deception. Jacob has deceived his brother and is deceived in turn by his uncle. The psalmist is upset because the fabric of community is threatened by forsaking the law, which is the solid but living framework of rules that safeguard community cooperation. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, Lessons violence, among other things, but allows us to cooperate peacefully with one another. Paul talks about how embedded we are in creation itself. The whole creation is yearning in a great act of childbirth to bring forth the human beings that will actually do the task that was given to our primal parents to tend and keep the earth. God's will for us is not individual extraction into heaven rather that all of our life, the life of earth itself, be lifted into union with the heavenly love. And Jesus shows us in short parables how that ceaseless penetration of all life by grace is among us, like yeast in bread, treasure in the field, a pearl of great price, demanding our closest attention and calling for cooperation and obedience. The spirit is at work in all things. The old translations say all things work together for good. That's not faithful to the Greek. It's a possible translation. It's things work together for good with those who are willing to open themselves to God's love so that God can work through us to bless us wherever we are, whatever happens to us, to help us weave and snake and find our way to the many challenges of life. God who brings healthy order out of chaos in order that we may freely assent to what is good rather than having it imposed upon us unwillingly by top-down order. And yet human beings all too often act as if God's gracious desire for our good encoded in the laws and wisdom of Holy Scripture reflected in our best laws and customs are some kind of imposition limit our freedom instead of empowering us to choose life and all that is good. The psalmist is upset. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep the law. Governor Cuomo could have quoted it. Our governor could have quoted it. Okay, people, the governors of the Northeast are saying, this is up to you people. We have these protocols. You're supposed to wear a mask. You're supposed to be distant. It's up to you to do it. And yet we have in the country, we have rallies to burn masks. We have a woman in Kentucky who says, I won't let other people's fear rob me of my freedom. As Frank Bruni said in the New York Times this week, right now, I, who love America deeply, am deeply and fiercely worried. Our struggle with this pandemic has convinced me that somewhere along the way, 
we went from celebrating individual liberty, liberty to fetishizing it so that for too many Americans, all sense of civic obligation and communal good went out the window. Somewhere along the way, we developed an immature definition of freedom, conflating it with selfishness, convenience, and personal comfort. That's writ large in the freak out over masks. In reality, they're a ticket to more freedom. So the mask is a symbol of our care for one another. And in this pandemic, there are the people who say, I won't let some hoax pandemic or somebody else's fear them in my freedom. And there are the people like the neighborhood in the northern part of Manhattan Island, poor neighborhood where lots of people are out of work, where, where, where the community group has set up different stations where people who have more can leave food for those who literally hardly have anything. And there are people that try to regulate this. And the, I, I was really struck by the sign they put up. This is, this is solidarity, not charity. That's Paul's vision. The spirit is moving us to know that we are members of one another, to help each other, each of us bearing our own responsibility and being responsible, but also having care and concern for others. And more people than that lady in Kentucky are doing that in this challenge. Without a vision, the people perish, says the book of Proverbs. And our world desperately needs a fresh vision of the common good and the protocols to achieve it. This isn't rocket science. This is the deepest cultural wisdom of the entire human race. The human race knows this. We've been around for a long time. It's right there, all too often buried, like abandoned treasure in a field, waiting to be discovered. Christians hear about it every time they hear scripture read, every time we pray for the world. We're all in this together. And if we are to survive, this is a challenge. There are more challenges ahead. We need to help each other build strong community in every one of those enlarging nests. Family, community, church, or workplace, the world, the creation itself. Build strong community. That's scripture from A to Z. Amen. Now let us stand and affirm our fidelity to the God of community who inspires community in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from him. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in a accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world. In peace.
peace we pray to you, Lord God, for the peace and well-being of the whole world. and the people of God in every nation. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For those who lead nations and province, state and community, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, and for the natural systems and myriad life forms that share this planet. For integrity and justice in the social order, the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the victims of the coronavirus pandemic. And all who risk themselves to minister to them. For the unemployed, dispossessed, and discouraged. For all who seek to support and empower those in need. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Carly, our bishop, Robert, our priest, and for all bishops and other ministers, lay and ordained, for all who serve God in this church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for our family, for friends who are ill or convalescing, Renee Markin, for the Marino family, Ann Matlack, Mendoza family, Dave Miller, Nicholas Nuno, Paulette, the Richardson and Dickhouse families, and Robert Butts. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy and strength. For all the blessings of this life, especially those celebrating a birthday, Jackie Vidiello, and celebrating an anniversary, Kimberly and John Butler. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, especially for Alvin Anderson and John Coward, in whose memory the altar is adorned, for those still dying in the pandemic, and for all we hold in our hearts, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Put their trust in you. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. O God, who has taught us that in quietness and confidence shall be our strength, let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts and be shed abroad through us as a blessing for all who cross our path. Amen. Good morning again, and thank you for tuning in on this service, which is being recorded and will be available throughout the day on Sunday and for the rest of the week and thereafter. You can find all that on our website. We hope you'll join us at 11 a.m. for a live Zoom coffee hour. Our organist, John Pavarnik, will be on hand and be co-host with me as we meet and greet and share our lives. You can find that link again on the website and in the e-blast that was sent out this week. Also, you will have received an e-blast actually received it twice, those of you who are on the eblast list, asking you to complete a parish uh, survey about your desires uh, for reopening when we actually begin in-person worship, which we're hoping to begin in various forms in August. Outdoors at this point, not indoors. Uh, there'll be limits on the number of people there, social distancing, masks, everything. We're thinking of a variety of ways to do worship in August. So stay tuned for that. And your feedback in the survey is going to be very important for that. So we come to the celebration of Holy Communion today. And as I said, this is the place where we lift our lives to be blessed by God, even though we're not receiving the bread and wine of communion. This is in and of itself 
a celebration of this larger communion of which I've spoken. Let us now go to the altar of God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts and lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people follow and praise in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. 
On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy upon us. O Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy upon us. O Jesus, redeemer of the world, give us your peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and rose again, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. These are the gifts of God for the people. Let us spiritually receive them. Lord Jesus Christ, this sacrament of bread and wine is the sign, symbol, and, and seal of your constant presence among us and with us to nourish, heal, purify, and bring forth the brightness of God's image in us. Grant that though we may not receive the outward signs of bread and wine in the sacrament, we may be inwardly united with your constant offering of yourself, the life of the world, and truly fed in our hearts with the grace of your constant love. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our part in hymn is hymn number 530 in the hymnal, Spread, O Spread, a Mighty Word. Verses 1, 2, and 3. 